Hi, this is Kate from Contemporary Geometric Beadwork. We're posting this video that gives a little more of an in-depth look to rounds 3, 4, and 5 of the Rick Rack for those of you who'd like a little more round-by-round -round guidance. These two video clips were excerpted from live sessions that we did on Facebook. This has been a really engaging time and uh, I've got a lot of neat things to show and tell in the pattern that we'll be releasing this week. And I'd like to really thank everyone for uh, beating along with us. These things are really fun for the team. And I know they might seem strange to people who've never beat it this way, but, you know, all together in a chaotic delight of different patterns, different colors, different beads, people all over the world. So let me just give people a chance to connect and I'm going to gather a few things here around me that I'd like to show you. Uh, we had some technical difficulties with Facebook yesterday. They just did a giant update, I think only to the business pages, but that, that's what we are. And so it was updating while we were trying to do live video, and it kind of came in and out. And uh, so we had a few technical difficulties. YouTube is also taking a good long time to process some of our videos, but the first official uh, Rick Rack video should be up on YouTube soon, and it covers the first two rounds. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to get into the third round, because this is also as far as we got yesterday in the live beat along on Facebook. We got a couple of rounds done, and so I want to show you the magnificent difference as we go from the second round to the third round and we begin to see structure. So I've been beating with red thread uh, and I'll continue doing that for a bit. So if you see the tips of my fingers turning red, don't worry. There's nothing wrong with me that uh, a good hand washing won't cure. I think it's just this batch of red Nymo that I got that seems to be a little bit, uh, a little bit weak on the dye. So, um, let's take a look at where we're at here. We have been suggesting that people do 12 rounds of Rick Rack on their podcast, but I would say the minimum that you want to do would be six. There's no hard and fast rule about how many rounds you need to do. I'm on my third round here. Um, each round will take you at least 20, 25 minutes, you know, even if you beat quickly. It might take you as long as an hour or more, so it's not insignificant what we're doing here. And you may decide that you'd like to finish your Rick Rack after six or seven or eight rounds and move on to the spine, and that is completely fine. The reason that I was suggesting that people do 12, which is what this section is here, 12, is so that you have a chance to experiment with pattern a little bit and to become extremely comfortable with the somewhat unusual idea of doing increases and decreases like this on a pod. But I think that you'll agree, if you're doing it with us, that it's a really nice way to keep them herded together. So I'd like to just do what I would normally do when I sit down to a piece of beadwork, is go around the edges of it with it, have a look, um, orient my beads, and you can see that I'm halfway through the third round. I wanted to have some of it done when I sat down with you because, you know, one stick is much like another at this point and I don't want to take a lot of your time beating all the way around. Nor do I think it's useful to just develop a spot of it, because one of the things I've noticed about this rickrack is that as it goes along, each round has such a significant personality that um, I think it pays to do each one in the round at least once all together so that we learn about it. And you can see me fussing with my beads here only to try to understand the situation with the thread. I like to I like to go around and check every so often. It's I some of you are just pattern wizards, but it's quite easy for me to miss laying in the decrease bead here if it's not right next to its neighbor. So the pod's been very nice for me, but I still check my work pretty frequently and I wanted to line the beads up so that you could see the vast difference in structure. So Rick Rack is is never going to be more than six beads per side here. And remember, I'm all in encouraging all of you, no matter what your size is, to do six. And just to be sure we're all speaking the same counting language, let me refresh our memory on what six is. Yeah? And so we count the increased beads on the side that they're on. And so right here are the six beads. Good morning, Susan. Karen, hello, hello. Claudia, I see some of you go by, but not all. 
if I don't greet you, it's only because I was looking at my beads. <laughs> what a treat to have you all with us. Um, feel free to use this thread, especially those of you who know what you're doing and you don't need to hear the little Rick Rack lesson. Use this thread as a chance to ask questions. Franklin Martin, Nico Williams, and Kat Oliva are downstairs and they're on the thread and they're available to talk. Kat has made a Rick Rack bangle and a podcast beat out of size 15 delicas, which is just fierce. And uh, we'll have a look at that this afternoon in a second live session when we do some deconstructions. This is the last day Franklin and Nico are in town. And so we're going to take apart what they've built so that you can see what we've got going on. So I'm just going to resume my stitches. And I'll chat about them when I get to the increase and decrease points. But basically, this is just a repetition all the way around of your side beads, four side beads, and then two tip beads and I'm doing all of the increased tips in the fabric color which in this case is a blue mix and I'm doing all of the decreased tips in a bright shiny gold so in this way I'm highlighting the decreases because I'd like you to have an opportunity to really understand the structure and to see that what you're doing here when you pull together the last bead of each round it isn't really decreasing your fabric because looking again at this rickrack the fabric stays the same no matter what uh, it's more a matter of moving the six beads vertically up the ladder so you get a fabric that climbs. And so uh, that's the best way to think about this. I've been thinking about rickrack for what seems like forever, but really can only be, you know, some small number of years. <laughs> I think we started thinking about it in... 2010 or 2009, but it seems like it's something I've been puzzling over forever. You know, like I've been asleep in a cave for a thousand years just thinking about increases and decreases. And you know, when you get a bug for these things, that's how it feels. I'm using a blue mix that I've just scattered out on my tray here for the color of the fabric, and I think I'm going to add a few beads to it. I, I want to really say I'm not fussy about color when I do mixes, and uh, it's been fun to see what others at the table are doing, but may I just show you, uh, I tend to just throw down a bunch of colors that are related, right, and uh, these are the colors that I just scattered out on my tray, uh, and I've been picking up almost randomly from the blues that I have available, but uh, I think I'm going to make a little bit lighter mix now as I come up. And so I'm going to change my available palette to these beads, and then I can still pick randomly. At some point, I'll throw in a white heart, and things will start to lighten up. But I have this little idea that what I'm doing is making a watery fabric that starts out deeper and then comes up to be a little bit more light. So I'll just do this as I go along, tend to change my palette of the mix on my tray. And I know this idea horrifies some of you who are very neat beaters, so I'm, I'm carefully not showing you things like my pile of beads so that you don't have to even know. <laughs> some of you are laughing thankfully right now. So I'm going to start um, fading, fading up Every so often, I'll go grab a dark bead, but I'm going to come up now and make more light water. And let me get some of these shiny silver beads. Those of you who have questions, again, great time to ask them. Welcome to everyone who's just joined. We appreciate your company. The, um, the first Rick Rack videos are still uploading on YouTube, but it shouldn't be long. And uh, we're not just editing the live sessions. I'm shooting completely new video for the project that is very straightforward, no chatter, just the steps. And so uh, it's still a long process. The podcast beat is still a very long process, right? Oh, now here's the point where I say I'm normally tempted to miss the moment. I'm beating along and I forget that it's time to get a gold bead. But setting the podcast up in this way is incredibly helpful for me. I'm just getting a few gold beads in my space. Because it's next to its neighbor, I have the opportunity to be immediately reminded of what was going on. Of course, since we're live, people would helpfully tell me, wrong bead! Which, as I said yesterday, I need that in my life. That's a little feature I need. I need smart people riding around on my shoulder telling me when it's time for things like decrease beads. 
So here I am putting on what I call the tip bead here, and I'm going to then pass through, as we saw yesterday, and as those of you know, I'm going to pass through the tip bead on the other side. So we never go into a tip again once we finish it, and we are now done with this tip bead, and we're ready to install another one. So next time we come through this round, we'll be pulling together the third tips, which we're placing right now. So that's why it's important to remember to place these, and you place them before you draw them together. For those of you who are pattern-minded, this is no problem at all. For the rest of us, I think you'll find this podcast bead uh, really delightful in the way it provides you checks and balances for where you've been and where you're going. So when I make each, uh, when I complete each little peak here, I have an opportunity to evaluate it in both directions. And this is extremely helpful for me because uh, it frees me to be more creative than uh, a watchdog. So I'll do just a few here so you can see how it's going. And then uh, I'll show you a deconstruction or two this afternoon that may blow your mind may blow your mind. I don't know. Some of you are doing some amazing things right now. You're blowing our mind. Joy Davison showed us uh, a s irregular rickrack that resembles a Greek key pattern that she took off a spine, and this is one of the things that we'll be working to develop. Uh, we were all just thrilled and amazed to see it. I'd love to see you experimenting with the forms that we're making here and then loop back to us and tell us all of the genius things you did. Mm. I've seen all kinds of things. Diane Fitzgerald's making uh, beautiful big flower shapes, and um, I've seen uh, gorgeous things come in the email just from yesterday. I'll, put in, I'll be putting together a shared post showing the things that you guys have sent in. So feel free to message your photos to the Contemporary Geometric Beadwork page or to email them to me at kate at katemckinnon.com. Uh, if you have questions, it's helpful to see a photo, and then it's nice to see the beautiful things you make. So I don't want to see 3,000 podcast beads. I want to see when you've done something extraordinary that pleases you. So I'm not trying to accumulate a library of everything. I want you to send me a photograph of something that you... See how it's so obvious here? Send me a photograph of something that you've done that you feel is unique or beautiful, or particularly pleased you, just to be clear. So here I am again, pulling together the decrease stitch. I will not be in that tip again. Instead, I'm installing the next tip. So this is all there is to round three. It's just a matter of remembering to place your tip beads. Uh, increases at one point, decreases at the other. And I'll just continue around beating, and uh, you guys can chat and ask questions. I'll probably keep this thread open for a half an hour so that people have a chance to come on, see the third round, ask the questions, and then I'll get back to posting the videos so that uh, you'll have a chance to see them before the afternoon deconstructions. And then we don't have an exact time for when we're going to start cutting things apart, but I would expect probably around 3 o'clock. And remember, don't worry about live. It'll still be here for later. Don't worry, those of you who sent me pictures of your plain beaded podcast. You know what? It's exciting to see some of them that are just ordinary and in different colors. But we don't need, you know, 3,000. Although, having said that, just thinking about having 3,000 little podcast beads made me so excited I could hardly see straight. Um, yesterday, we had a fun time meeting with a gallery representative, gallery curator, who... Uh, was talking to us just about exhibitions and things like that and the point of that conversation is that it made me think about how exciting it will be when we do these big global calls for everybody make a podcast bead you know one inch in diameter and then covering a wall with them and making a sort of self-organized structure I dream of things like this at night and so that conversation, thinking about, wow, you know, making exhibits and doing larger things, 
really got me dreaming in the night about how fun it will be when we can all work together on large pieces. So we're going to be thinking about that next year, and perhaps you can be thinking about it too. If you could have 3,000 of something or 10,000 of something, what would it be? What would it be? Triangles? Hypers? Podcast speeds? Tell us your dreams. I'm using size B Nymo over here for those of you who are having thread questions, but I know it looks like D. The red is so much thicker than the brown, I cannot even believe it. I felt like because it was a little thicker, I could see it better on video. Just change to it for that reason. And I like it on the spool, of course. I won't shut up about it. I use the three ounce cones, and they look like this. And this is the bottom of mine. And so you can see it's a bee. Shoe red, it's called, which just thrills me. And then I use a brown in bee, too. I think they call it sable brown. But in here it just says brown. And so also a bee. It says coats, but they get it from, I think, Belding Corticelli is the name of the company in Italy. And when companies like Fire Mountain Gyms buy it and sell the spools, they're actually spooling down from the giant reels that they get from the factory. So that's another reason the three-ounce spools are great is because they were probably coming off of, you know, spools that were feet in diameter. Or at least that's how I dream of it, that the spools are like giant wheels of Dutch cheese. <laughs> I'm now in round five of my rickrack, and in fact you can see that I'm just coming down to a decrease point here. I've just placed this bead, I am making a decrease stitch, and I'm doing the last couple of points of round four. And uh, you can see the decrease beads very well in this colorway. I'm happy with calling them out this way. I think it'll be fun to see them march along as we go. And as soon as we get to six rounds, you're welcome to stop the experiment, um, but 12 will give you a better sizing. So see, I placed the last bead there. I'm marching onward. So once you have a rickrack section of 12, then you can really judge the fit. So bead until you feel that you understand the stitch. Don't do more than 12 because we, uh, you know, we want a manageable set. Please join us for step four of this exploding podcast set. When we finish the rickrack, weave in our thread and put on six rounds of plain peyote that will equal two complete casting spines. One will grow up to be a helical coil and the other will be a tool that you will make new work off of.